And hello. Okay, audio seems to be all good. Please hope the closed captions are working today. Oh, it means you've been put to a VIP. Closed captions stop working. Why the fuck have the closed captions stopped working? Two seconds. I know why. Why did that shut? Flip. Uh, window. Is it working now? Is it working now? Okay, yeah, basically, uh, uh... Sorry about this, everything now needs to reload, basically, because I cocked up. Um, I was meant to close a tab, I accidentally closed an entire window that I use for sorting. Excellent. Okay, we're back. Everything's good. Everything's good. Right. Uh, today's going to be a bit weird. I'm going to be honest with you. Um, so, for those who are not following us on social media, uh, basically, work super bugged me out this week. Uh, hence why... Um... The game's design didn't happen Friday, and there wasn't, um... Um, hence why there wasn't, um, anything yesterday. Uh, because I basically, I need to get some coursework done, which I've managed to do. I've not completed it, but I've managed to get more of it done. And, um... I basically spent yesterday chilling out a bit to try and burn off the burnout. Um, also, for those who aren't aware, uh, let's just say the drive for a lot of us to do games design has kind of fallen off a very steep, spectacular cliff. Uh, the... So uh, I'll go into it because it kind of affects this. Um, effectively, if you want to make D and D content and publish it, generally the rule has been you either have to use the DM's Guild, which point you have a special contract, or you use the Open Gaming License, which is where you effectively have a very sparse version of the core rules, but you can work off them. This allows people to publish subclasses or adventures. Mm. The problem was, uh, so the first time it leaked, everyone was a bit, okay, we're not 100% sure. Wizards of the Coast kind of made a statement that basically, and th there's a Ko-Fi post I made about this where I was kind of like, okay, if this is all the 1.1 OGL is, that's fine. Like... Them getting a royalty cut isn't completely against what I am about because I also, for those who don't know, I do a lot of software stuff. I am a huge into computer science, software development, video game development. And, you know, if you want to use Unity or the Unreal Engine, all of them have, you're free to develop a video game until you hit a point, then you have to pay us some money for the using of the license because you've made this much profit. That's fine. The problem is they basically went, oh, 
we're going to deactivate the previous OGLs. Now, there's a lot of uncertainty on how that would go. Uh, I believe the 100% conclusion is this will have to go to a court of law because... The contract never says it was unrevocable. But because, especially for the 3.5 OGL, it has been so long. And because there has long been this idea that people can make money off this, it's not going to be revoked. Especially when Wizards of the Coast have added clauses going. If we have the right to change the OGL, but you have a right to use a previous version of this license. It gets into this weird legal quagmire of technically they never said it was irrevocable, but there's a lot of language they use that implied that there was an irrevocability about it. I mean, as one person said, it's basically, it doesn't matter how bad the 1.1 OGL is, because if you agree to it, you agree to it. That's great. If you want to make one D&D content, you do that. But it's the concept that they could revoke the earlier stuff. And what gives the leaks some credibility is the fact that the chief game producer for Kickstarter basically came out on Twitter and said, App retweeting the post that talks about the leaks yeah no we have negotiated with wizards that we that the royalty amount will be less if someone crowdfunds their thing through kickstarter and it's like okay so what you're saying is the leaks are actually legitimate or at least that bit about kickstarter is legitimate which then gives weight to the rest of the leak being at least somewhat legitimate um so i mean i've taken down basically everything on itch.io and on the dm skill i've basically taken everything down because i'm having to think about well how will this work uh at least D, &D wise obviously this werewolf game i'm doing for itch.io that's fine because it isn't D, &D. <laughs> you know it ain't D, D. it's something standalone um, on the one hand, yes. On the other hand, it's it's complicated because, as one person's pointed out, one thing you can do is you can always negotiate individual licenses with the bigger companies and then go this is the OGL uh, I mean some of the other bits because there was a bit where I basically uh, I'll pull up actually the code I think I wrote because that kind of for the original uh, OGL thing that was it to put out hold on where, where, where the fuck is it uh, I have lost my mouse give me just a second there we go uh my mouse has stopped disappearing now. Uh, where did we put it? Kofi, Kofi, Kofi. Uh, because the weirdness is, if it was a contract to be negotiated, that would make sense. The problem with the OGL is the OGL. It's it's got this weirdness that, to a degree, you don't negotiate an open gaming license. Because it's basically you and your legal team going, yo, community, here is a bone. Um, you, you don't need to negotiate that. Um, so, I'm more on the fence of... Now, that doesn't mean they won't change it. Because, hopefully, with the feedback everyone has given they will realise that perhaps they went too far. Uh, um, now, admittedly, they could, they could have gone, oh yeah, we'll make something so outrageous that the internet will go, what the fuck, and then we can go, here's something nicer, aren't we so amazing? 
but at the same time they already could have done that they just didn't have to because as everyone says no one really cares what's in the new OGL as long as you were allowed to still use the old OGL because um, that, that that's always just been a thing you can always use the old OGL therefore there's no need to worry about so yeah here we go uh, at least I would if I loaded um, Ah, lip nuggets. Um, sorry, everything is being slow today, and I really don't want to fuck around with the internet settings. Because if I do that, we could just lose the whole thing. Here we go. So basically, at the time, my view, and it still is my view, is... I, at the time, and I would still love to still make D&D content, uh... Basically, I largely um, like I make stuff for fun. I make no money. Like I think the most money I have ever made of anything I have published in D Wise was like a pound because of what because every guy I do is pay what you want because we're in a cost of living crisis even before then I was like I want people to play the thing and I don't want money to be a thing that stands in the way of people being able to play the stuff I write um, admittedly there is stuff I put behind uh, the membership on Ko-Fi every month which is also on hiatus until uh, we know exactly where we stand with stuff but Uh, even with that, I was like, you can, you can pay a pound a month, you get access to all our games design. And there's always a chance I can take it from the membership and then put it into a published thing. Uh, Ko-Fi doesn't. Um, under the current leak, you cannot put your... Uh, no, sorry. Basically, any revenue you would make from Ko-Fi or Patreon, if you have games design locked behind it, um, is counted as revenue for the purposes of all the stuff. Um, it doesn't count as separate, which is one of the other things that is causing a bit of a um, stinker. Um, but basically, my, my personal view was, uh, so they released the article discussing it, um, it's only for TTRPG rules I had no problem with because a lot of people have gone this affects streaming to which my line is no it doesn't streams used fan creation content uh, that there was a uh, kind of fan creation content thing so that that's what streams have always used is the fan creation that's fine that one they would always have trouble going after because it'd be the same as a video game company going we will sue anyone who play who streams our video games like good luck <laughs> seriously good luck <laughs> there's a reason no one's done it so far um not because it's necessarily difficult but because the amount of bad will you would get your game would fall into the ground into a bottomless pit uh there was rumours everyone would have to try and use the DMs Guild, which still doesn't look like, it just looked like, as before, the DMs Guild is your better contract. Because for those who don't know, the OGL has a lot of stuff like, um, you're not allowed to use Mind Flayers. Uh, mind Flayers and Illithids are copyrighted terms that you cannot use with the OGL. Um... So if you want to use them, you have to use the DMs Guild, because basically the DMs Guild is a free license to add bits of Wizards of the Coast's own IP. Um, yeah. It, 
it removes a lot of old systems as the pro it, it gets complicated i'll get to it in a minute but uh, basically this is from the old uh, the the previous article they put on D, D beyond where they went this is what 1.1 is going to be and it was like you know dm skill and lets you mess with wizard ip if you don't want to mess with wizard's ip you'd use the ogl that was fine um only ttrpg rules i was also fine with um i know it some people say it affects vtt's i'm not 100 percent sure why because i oh, know i'd have to look a lot deeper into it i'm not 100 percent sure where people are getting the idea that it ruins vtt i know some people have said it will stop nfts i'm also not sure how nfts unless it was like each nft has a games design piece how that would work but I'm not 100 percent sure um so then it's like if you're making share like content that was going to change what you're already used to uh they kind of went if you're doing fret free share like content then it was the the co the comment i had back then was it wasn't clear what free share like content was what is pay what you want what is putting behind a paywall uh, at least by the leak it implies that paywalled content is not considered free share like content because there is money in the way therefore you would count that as a source of revenue um except license terms let us know what you're offering to sale i was personally fine with that as long as because hopefully it would come with it help um i'm aware their articles on this uh, this post that i made was about the D, D beyond post to the because effectively there was a wave of leaks all off the wall all crazy all it was kind of like everyone had their own rumor so then i may uh then they made a dnd beyond post i made this response to the dnd beyond post then there was an article that uh there was the gizmodo leaks which is the stuff that seems substantiated um or at least i think someone might have leaked it and then they did their article and then gizmodo took parts of that article it, it gets complicated i'm not 100 percent clear on things but i'm not sure how it affects vtt's nfts but so accept the license turn let us know what you're offering for sale this was fine for me because yeah okay i'm declaring an agreement i'm going to make stuff report ogl avenue if you make more than fifty thousand, seventy-five thousand, you get uh stuff i didn't see it as too big a problem because for me personally i looked at it in the same way that of game dev using unity or unreal did i know some people are very much like no especially kickstarters because kickstarters is the worst offender of because it often goes to print and because you have so many add-ons for hitting kickstarter gold because it's just the standard you will make a plushy tea coasters whatever all of that has cost and you will try to absorb some of it so that it doesn't become unreasonable for the consumer which then means your profit is very small and i believe the main problem that has come out is this number of 7500 is not before costs it is profit and of course the problem in profit is that or at least the kickstarter it was profit i think um it gets a bit complicated basically on the one principle i'm not objecting to paying money to a company if you earn over a certain amount for using the game effectively the game engine that they're using but some of the weird stuff that has come out about it is making me kind of squint um concluded create a badge on the work i had no problem with uh, because to me what this basic screen was hopefully we would get oversight hopefully and that was the big one for me was we would get guidance because there's actually very little guidance on how to implement the ogl it's kind of like here's the legal document do it and you're kind of sat there going okay i need help here how do i do it how do i know what what uh i how do I know the different bits, what I need to include to cover myself and be safe? Um, 
do it properly that doesn't have the uh, license revoked. Um, it, it was very confusing. Um, and then from what I gather from people, like, it's now the OGL is like, at least the leaked one was a 20 page document with a lot of legalese and it's like okay this is great if you're critical role or paizo who have lawyers if you're timmy or me from down the street who's just doing this because they enjoy it and if they make some money off it cool they make some money off their hobby it's like there's so much legal stuff, you're so likely to get in trouble, it becomes intimidating to even try and design for it, because what if I accidentally misunderstood a clause and now I'm in trouble? Um, I mean, a lot of people have gone out and basically said, this has been written by lawyers, but lawyers who don't necessarily understand TTRPGs. Which is hopeful, you know, hopefully, I am all for hopefully... Enough stink being raised, stuff changes, everything improves, we're all happy. But at the moment, um, my big thing is, on the one hand, I would love to take it with a grain of salt. On the other hand, do I want to spend effort... Because uh, the way you've got to look at it is, as someone who is currently writing games and releasing games design pieces for D&D, &D, <laughs> and really doesn't have the income to be able to fight a legal battle if it came to it, can I afford to take the risk... I mean, I'm not releasing a Kickstarter. I'm not like some people who are literally having to make effectively a life and death decision for their business going do we go ahead with a kickstarter when we could be breaking some legal thing for a decision that we don't know the ramifications of yet um i'm not quite in that situation but i'm still making games design i still have the modern day subclasses i've been working on i would love to release more than just the bard but now i'm sat there going shit can I? <laughs> you know, can I do this? Um, because... And and as I said, it, 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 this week has really been a stressful week. Because you sit there and you go... This is... I don't earn enough money to be packed by the royalty fees but there's still the bit of you having to register you having to do all this stuff if i release stuff a fifth edition with an old ogl does that impact that does what you know it's just and also the fact i have stuff behind a paywall while i haven't made money off that paywall i technically still have this content behind it uh it's just it's a lot so for now effectively for a lot of DD stuff i'm kind of going i'm just going to put it on hold we're just not going to touch it <laughs> uh, but it has kind of drained the joy of the game's design because you're kind of sat there going uh. <laughs> you know and uh I, I'm very aware that the next line that comes out of a lot of people is, well, you can design stuff for other systems. And it's like, I have, I do, in fact. Uh, you don't see it publicly because um, some systems are even worse than D&D for doing um, homebrew. Uh, no, people shouldn't have to have a law degree to understand this. And the problem is, you're hearing lawyers going, um... Actually, we're not 100% sure how this would go. Because basically, if tomorrow Wizard of the Coast went, yep, everything you've heard is true, this is the OGL, the first thing that every lawyer has agreed on is you, it, the only way this could be settled is in the court of law. 
which then you hit the problem of and this is where as everyone has said wizards of the coast has a bit of an advantage is they're owned by hasbro who is a multi-million dollar corporation and can afford a very large legal team and then there's everyone who makes their games who do not have very large legal teams and the problem with going to court is it's very easy to just go okay it's now a war of attrition who has the money to keep paying the lawyers to keep this going because at least from what i gather with the american legal system the big problem they have is it's very easy to hold things up in court keep delaying and of course you still have to pay your lawyer for all that time uh, which gives hasbro a bit of an advantage I mean, I'm going to be very clear. Whether it's true or not, I do not agree with harassing any games designers, be they working for Wizards of the Coast or not. Be it true or not, we should always remember that corporations are not our friends and allies. And capitalism is an ass. But at the same time, it's like, ah... Uh, <laughs> You know, it's just, uh, it's a lot. It, it is a lot, and like, it sucks. It sucks that, because I, I will blame it on the legal department. Let, let's just, let's just assume it is the legal department of Hasbro going, yo, we just want to, we want to, you know, rock up the competition a bit. It's sad that basically someone in a lawyer suit can go, hey, everyone who enjoys TTRPGs, fuck you. <laughs> you know. And I think that's the sad bit. It's just like that a couple of people in suits could write up a contract and basically go fuck you to the entire TTRPG community. The other problem I have is it's very easy to come up with a new game. It's very easy to come up with a little game like uh, this werewolf one and release it. But there are lots of indie TTRPG designers. There are lots of different systems. And while everyone always goes, it's very hard sometimes to design things for them because anyone can design an event you can design an adventure from nearly any system because at the end of the day you're designing a narrative uh, see the horror adventures we're doing i've made a world i've made rules the narrative doesn't really matter what system i run it in i could run it in the dragon age system or fantasy age system i could run it in monster hearts i could run it in pretty much any ttrpg there is that allows for monsters investigation preferably combat but doesn't have to at combat the problem comes with um i am not just an adventure writer i like doing crunchy mechanics and someone would go yeah but you you could design stuff for insert game system here and it's like okay i can design uh monster hearts 2 is one i've played recently and it's like i could design uh, effectively the character class the kind of monster that you are i could design uh, uh, for the age games, I've designed subclasses, magic items. With Pathfinder 2, I could do subclasses and classes. The problem with Pathfinder 2 is I couldn't do fun magic items because Pathfinder has a specific kind of power scaling with its magic items. Um, and this is the main problem. This is why I really like D&D. &D, is D&D &D was just that perfect sweet, sweet spot with the different mechanical uh, chewiness. Like, that doesn't mean I don't, I'm not designing for other games. I am. Um, I've long wanted to do... There was kind of an adaptation of Call of Cthulhu system, but made for kind of 
a modern day military thing and the main reason I wanted to mess with that was to do some SCP um, adventures for that system. Uh, my friend made a games design system. Uh, Monster Hearts is kind of the... Oh, God. Monster Hearts is... Let me see if I remember this. I believe it's one of the games that uses the power by the apocalypse. And it's kind of like... Ex the, the best way to describe it is nearly every monster in quotation marks is a different version of exploring sexuality identity etc etc um, it's it doesn't really I don't really I'm not sure if I if it really has a setting i mean i guess it always sets itself during high school and teenage years and it's kind of the using the monsters to explore themes and topics that you normally would in a story involving teenagers um in their journey of self-discovery etc etc um yeah it's pretty old ubt if i recall um do recommend Monster Hearts. It's a good system. To be honest, there are lots of systems I recommend because they're all good systems. But it's it's just a shame that there isn't one that really does D and D. And at that point, I then have to sit there as a game designer, and go, should I just design an RPG? And at that point, it's like I I had this uh, I had this conversation. I had to have this conversation with my partner. I sat there going. I don't have the, in the nicest and politest way possible, I don't have the ego to design my own system. I just sit there and I'm just like, I am, am I a good enough games designer to design my own system? To which someone, to which I had to be reminded, is like, you, you can do it. <laughs> so who knows, if the OGL completely blows up and everything goes to shit, I can always look at designing a system. It'd just be a really sad day if that happens, because it's like, It'd just be a very sad day. On the one hand, on the other hand, though, it'd be kind of neat because at least I could kind of go, well, I like this thing this other game did. I wish D&D could do more. It's like, well, what if I designed a game that covers that base? <sighs> Which is kind of what the, uh, uh, at the top of the uh, screen, the uh, winter experiment project was originally, was me looking, going, if I wanted to modify uh, the 5e rules, how would I do it? And now it's like, what if I just wanted to make a d20 game? The only thing is I can't call it a d20 game. <laughs> Which one's the Caltrop? Oh god, no. <laughs> Yeah, because uh, for those who aren't aware, you have to be very careful if you make a system using D20, because technically Wizards of the Coast owned the trademark for the phrase D20 system. Oh, D100. D100 is the classic. I just really don't like D100 systems. <laughs> I'm sorry to say it. I don't like D100 systems. <laughs> Which is the same, really, because one of, there's one RPG I've always wanted to play. Uh... Like, there are some cool things you could do, like, uh, my one friend, uh, the one game I enjoyed playing was a 3d6 system, you always rolled 3d6, and 
uh, that's the age setting, which is probably the setting, uh, sorry, not setting, the system I have done the second largest amount of games design for. Uh, effectively, every dice roll was 3d6. Um, I call it the age system, but technically you have Dragon Age, Fantasy Age, Modern Age, The Expanse, uh, Blue Rose... They all used the same core system and then kind of had extra bits based on which one you were doing. But effectively it's 3d6 uh, for your tests. Um. So yeah. Um, if there are some weeks where we're not doing games design streams, you now know why, because it basically means that whatever news came out that week, I'm probably too depressed to do more games design. Um, yeah, it was made for, uh, it, I believe the original system was made for the Dragon Age RPG. It's done by a company called Green Ronin. They then basically adapted the, uh, Dragon Age system into a generic fantasy system. Uh, there are only three classes in the game. There is Fighter, Wizard, and I think it's either Rogue or Thief. It's basically, there is a fighting class, there is a magic class, there is a stabby class, and then you have subclasses where you pick your specific thing. Uh-oh. What's the uh-oh? Sorry, there's a there's a delay, so I'm not sure which bit. <laughs> I mean, the main bit that uh, has a lot of people concerned about the new OGL is the bit where Wizards goes. We own uh, all things published under all the OGLs. Uh, Green Rose, one of the companies that are going to get hit by OGL. Um... Yes, because they do do some D&D stuff. The advantage they do have, as I said, is they do have the age system, which is completely separate from... Uh... Oh, was Mutants and Masterminds OGL? Bloody hell. That was OGL. Fuck. See, this is the problem. There's a lot of games that used OGL. Um, there was a Star Wars RPG, owned, which used D20 Modern, which, of course, used OGL. But this is where we're going to get into the fun bit, because if Wizards tried to claim intellectual rights to all of these things that used the D20 systems and used OGL, if they try to like claim Star Wars, they're going to get hit by something with Disney because it's like, okay, yes, we made this game using this open game license. You're changing the contract on us. <laughs> Give us a reason not to slap you <laughs> with a lawsuit. <laughs> so I think that's the one thing Hasbro will fear is a company like Disney who will just sit there and go, hmm, cute slap. But yeah, anyone use it. This is the problem with so many things use the OGL. And it's like, okay. Because technically the new OGL at the very least goes like, we not only rescind the old OGLs, but we also claim ownership of anything published under any of them. It's like, ugh. But it would be amusing if they, if uh, I don't think anyone in Hasbro would be dumb enough to try and claim anything with the word Star Wars attached to it, but you never know. That's it. it. It's that bit where the the way I'm treating this is, um, I am going along the line of, I'm just not going to do any more D and D stuff until we have a bit more idea what's going on. Not necessarily because, oh my God, wizards, blah 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 blah, blah but because I just don't want to get caught in the middle of something and get tripped up, shall we say. 
So my current plan is, um, obviously for January, we have this game. We're working on Surviving Winter. After that, um, after that, I'm not sure what we'll do. I might try and play more with this, uh, idea of trying to make a game system that does not require the use of the OGL. Um, but we'll have to see. We will just have to see. And um, because I think one of the things someone was saying and i think it makes the most sense when you think about it is really what this ogl is doing is attacking anyone because the big line they've used for one D D is one D D is 5e backwards compatible and of course the big line is nearly everyone who went i don't like the sound of 1.1 was okay we'll just keep making things for fifth edition which theoretically is backwards compatible with one D&D. And at that point, you start to hit issues of... Uh, so one of the things that's been discussed is, is this OGL not necessarily... I mean, it's it kind of probably a two birds, one stone. Not only is it attacking their competitors, but it's also attacking the concept of 5th edition being a competitor to 1 D&D. &D. Which is a somewhat reasonable conclusion to come to, because if you think about it, if they attack 5e and just basically go, okay, all your 5e products now either have to use this new contract or stop being a competitor, basically. So, we will have to see. Um, it's it's just sad. <laughs> it's, it's just how I'm going to describe it. It's just it's, it's a sad day to be someone who likes to make games for TTRPGs. Oh, uh, right. But anyway, we should keep on with this. So, yeah. Oh, right, where did we get to last time? So, we were dealing with the Beast Within. Um, right, I can't remember where we got to. Oh, yeah, this is where we got to. So, basically, what we established was... Uh, so... Quick re summary. Basically, basic rules is... Everyone is a werewolf. You've got to survive the winter, which is from December 1st to February the 28th. And each day is made of four phases, two in night, two in day. Character creation is very uh, loose, but you've got to have a primary destructive emotion that is attached to your character and tied to your transformation. Uh, you have the stats, endurance, physique, determination, knowledge, gathering, social skills, lycanthropy. Uh, you also have hunger, stress, and cold. We've basically established that the four phases, you have to do activities. This can be a restful activity or an active activity. Sleep is a rest activity. And basically, depending on what activities you do, depends how your stress, your hunger, and other stuff get affected. At phase one, which is morning, and phase three, which is evening, uh, temperature and weather card or dice roll will be made to determine how that changes. Um, basically, every phase is you pick an action, you pick a random uh, modifier card, you roleplay the event, taking into account the random modifier card. You then have to make a roll to see if it was a positive or a negative event. You have the temperature, which basically affects your stress, your cold, 
and what you're able to do, your food and hunger, which um, the hungrier you are, the more susceptible to the cold you are. Um, the cold can kill you, hunger cannot, hunger just makes you get stressed even quicker and more susceptible to the other stuff. Uh, gathering is a special action which has its own mechanics, but basically it lets you try and stave off the cold and hunger. Stress relief is basically... Uh, the more likely the the higher your stress the more likely you are to transform when you transform you then have to make another stress test roll against um the beast within otherwise you succumb to the emotion if the primary stressor you come across in your day you have to make a stress test to try and not transform uh, once transformed Every phase you are transformed, you have to make a test against the beast within. Unless you get rid of the beast within, you cannot untransform. The beast within only lasts for two phases. Uh, full moons basically make a prolonged event. Longest night will probably also give a prolonged transformation. Um, so you've got the beast within, which is basically you get overtaken by the extreme of your negative emotion you can give in to the beast within to relieve all of your stress but the downside is for the next um for the next phase you've given in to the beast within and the next two phases um you effectively it begins to affect you when you're untransformed you're affected by the emotion. But what you can do... Uh, oh, another thing uh, with stress relief is... You can have a communal action where for a phase... The group spends time telling stories, reminiscing... And then, based on the number of people in the event... Your stress goes down by that amount. So it helps to have time for community and coming together. The more violent way of dealing with the beast within is you can fight it, effectively you summon it, if you summon it for the next seven days. Uh, potentially. As I said, I made it primarily for uh, uh, the Winter Werewolves game jam. Uh, effectively, I mean you could. Um, you could also make new scenarios. Um, you could add extra random events. Um, technically, yeah, because currently where creatures are dealing with emotion. I mean, this is kind of a combination of dealing with mental health issues and a cost of living. Like, the two impotences of this game was our current cost of living crisis in the UK <laughs> and people not being able to afford to fuel, uh, heat their homes. And on the other hand, lycanthropy being a sign of um, being kind of mental illness. It didn't. It wasn't intended to be mental illness. It just ended up being, huh, yeah, this is kind of touching on mental illness and trauma and healing that as a community while also dealing with a very traumatic event. IRL. Um, so theoretically you could kind of make rules for other uh, uh, werewolves. I mean, if you think about it, you have these stats. If you weren't a werewolf, you just ignore lycanthropy. The surviving, the temperature, the cold, the food and hunger, all of that can remain. I guess what you would potentially do is you would call lycanthropy um, I wouldn't want to call it the thing within I bet you'd call it your monster stat you would then have stress what you would effectively do is you would you would look at stress and relief and because we've got a chapter on transforming you would have a similar chapter for other stuff so for like vampires you might have bloodlust and it'd be the same base mechanics which is 
if you fail stress, you show your monstrous side. Um, maybe witches. The problem with witches is there isn't really a monstrous. How, how, there isn't really a monstrous side to witches unless you want to go kind of down the fey route. The problem there is you start to go into territory of uh, IRL problems that people who would basically be accused of witchcraft had to deal with. So, probably not witches. You maybe have like vampires. Um, you, you basically you would end up replacing werewolf with something else that has a monstrous side to it that you're kind of trying to keep in control of the problem is i'm not really sure where you would go with it because it's like oh yeah you're a vampire you just um Unless you change the way that they feed, you start to go the um, Dresden Farm method where, yeah, you heard the vampire that feasts on blood, but you also the vampire that feasts on emotions, and... Yeah, it... The lycanthropy kind of has something, it kind of, I, I don't know, it kind of... Th there's two stages to the story, the obvious is you're a lycanthrope, but then there's the other side, which is, you know, you're dealing with emotions, you're dealing with mental stuff, you're, you're kind of, you're telling a story there. Whereas with kind of some other monsters, I guess you have this, like, you have to kind of go, what, what would adding this monster other than the factor of it's a different monster it's like well what would this monster actually bring because either you have to change the way they interact with the game state because currently how lycanthropes interact with the game state is they have a risk reward with the game state that if you are failing in your activities, if you're just getting cold and you're desperately in need of food, well, you can transform and go out and hunt for food or gather berries or whatever, however you wish to do it. But while you're in your lycanthropy, you don't feel the cold. You're not being affected by the temperature. In fact, you'd heat you, you're, you're the cold stat, the longer you do it, is going down. The problem is, every time you're in that state, you're at risk of transforming into the beast within. Uh, I wouldn't be so much worried about stepping on one of Darkness's toes. It's just... What are you... I guess for this game, it's what are you getting out of that thing? I mean, here it's... The game is primarily... I mean, the lycanthropes aren't the main thing. They're just something that added depth over time to it. But kind of, it's, it's really a game about surviving the winter, coming together as a community, and through bonds togetherness deal with this thing if no it's a bit harder with like unless you start going yeah some characters could be werewolves some of characters can be vampires and that chain that would change things that would probably be the most interesting element but again the question comes what do they um what is added to the game, either in an, a unique interaction or a narrative kind of feel, by adding that other thing? Maybe.
not sure. Uh, that would be something I think about after I've managed to get all this working. So yeah, uh, basically you transform. Um, you have to go against Beast Within. Beast Within gets out. Uh, one thing you can do is fight it. So how it works is... Uh, here we go. You can force the Beast Within, if you defeat it in a fight, to sleep. For seven days. After seven days, you've got to fear the beast within again, unless a full moon or longest night event occurs. When they occur, the beast within automatically wakes up early from sleep. Um, if the characters fail to make the beast within sleep, the character who's affected gets five hunger, five stress. And they cannot make any stress tests to regain control until the phase two phase duration has passed. Basically, if you fuck up putting to sleep the beast within, you cannot attempt to stop the beast within until it has naturally settled down. And at that point, you've gained hunger and stress, which means you're liable to fail again. When characters, uh, so for the right, it's basically a small right that's carried out. You gather around the character whose beast is unleashed. You focus your memories, your feelings, your bonds for the character. And you summon the beast as a physical entity, which will be referred to as the beast manifested. Or manifested beast, I can't remember which way around I put it. Um, from there, they can fight the manifested beast to subdue it the area where they perform the writing basically becomes sealed away its own mini dimensional space no one outside can see in time seems to stand still outside the space the fight ends when either everyone participating is knocked out or the beast has been subdued when this occurs the beastie manifests and the space created disappears Uh, it's damaging it till it stops moving, basically. Um, if the table DM wishes further changes to happen in the dimensional space, they can do. But again, this is this is very basic combat rules. If a character wanted, if a DM sorry wanted or a table wanted, they could very easily uh, alter the rules. Uh, basically you make a physique test roll to determine order and then basically every stat now has a different function so endurance is just your hit points if you hit zero hit points you're knocked out the fight physique is your physical damage and affects your target to be hit by attacks determination does spells noise does spell gatherings and using environment social skills is spells and lycanthropy again you can use it instead of another trait for a trait test and use for channeling the beast so you can either punch someone which is you make uh, basically if i say the word x trait test it's roll a d20 and add that trait so you either make a physique test if successful 1d6 for each point of physique you have is dealt as damage if physique or endurance is your highest value trait increase the damage to a d8 and you get one special point then you have casting which has six spells in total two determination spells two knowledge spells two social skill spells determination is blasting which is basically you make an attack at range all of these have basically two spells that all the effects have if the associated skill is your highest then you can increase the die and you get a special point or something else happens um so blast is you just shoot someone with magic and then the other thing is empower which is you increase your allies special by your determination um, however, 
um, and this is where uh, the spells get weird, is there's effectively there is a base spell and a power spell. The power spell gives more special if it's your thing. Um, and it has a really cool effect. The disadvantage is if it ma if your emotion and the beast's emotion is the same negative emotion, there is a risk that the spell will empower the beast instead. So in case of power, it's you give special to the um, beast as well as the target. Um, you have social skills, which is healing, which is just you roll the die, you heal. If social skills your highest skill, you get to... Um, Prove your healing die, and you get to can't try and calm the beast. Uh, I, the powers determination. Oh yeah, so it has to make a determination roll against your social skills. It, if it fails the test, it cannot perform any action. Basically, is stunned. If it succeeds, the caster takes two stress, and that stress number is doubled. If your primary destructive emotion is the same as the beasts and you have to make a test against the beast within in your next phase basically calm is the most powerful spell because it will stun the thing the problem is if you try to calm the beast but you and its emotions are the same thing it can backfire horribly uh, if you do not know the beast's primary emotion it has a plus five bonus to its determination check if it shares a primary emotion, you always know what the emotion is because you know you've just made a terrible mistake. Because you get angry, it is angry. And uh, now you've got to do your beast. And then it's uh, for knowledge, it's you can reduce um, damage with protect. And then its special thing is warding, which is you get to pick an effect upon it. So you can reduce the number of actions it takes, you make it unable to reach a character, uh, you give it a negative modifier to hitting people, basically it's a, it's a control spell. So, and then all these things are special, and the reason special is important is special actions, so you, if you do certain steps, um, you get special points, and special points can be used to do cool stuff. You get one special point at the start of every turn. Um, you can channel bonds, channel the beast, or do a lycanthropic action. Um, lycanthropic action is basically going to be, for example, say you are a werebird. Well, you can fly or do something a bird could do if you are aware or maybe you can core it with your tusks you know lycanthropic action is basically you get to do something cool using your lycanthropy that only your beast could do um channel bonds is basically you going to be able to use the bonds you share with another character to do something cool what I'll probably well channel bonds will probably be is you get to combine your action with another character's action for a sh combined effect, and then channel the beast is basically you get to make a special attack using your primary destructive emotion, but channeled in a positive aspect. And what I'll probably say is if it shares an emotion with the carrot with the beast being targeted, it does extra damage. Um, Gathering's going to be weird. How I basically want gathering to work is you get a chance to manipulate the environment where the combat is happening. Um, because it's this dimensional space, maybe it's like you get to determine something or you can find something in the environment that you can use as a weapon to then give yourself a buff or give an ally a buff. So it's like, I found a wooden plank with a nail in it. Cool, you now have a weapon. Uh, get a plus one to that thing. So that's so I need to basically work on gathering, get that to work. Uh, get the three special actions to work. And then... Um, playing the beast within. We need to work out the stats of the beast within. We need... Um, 
special attacks for the beast within and it will probably much like i've done casting gets two things it will probably be here are some generic actions and then depending on the emotion here are some examples whoever is playing the beast will get to pick get to come up with something um maybe an ability that lets it and then probably some specials for it so i might give like a special that lets it counter abilities an opponent does using emotions um we'll probably do something where it can affect characters that share emotions uh potentially can do things that up stress up um hunger cold and then potentially do stuff like um, maybe as a special, anyone that shares an emotion with it on the next phase has to make a roll against the beast within. So it will never, it will never, um, I think all of its actions are technically lycanthropic actions, basically, uh, is how I'm going to phrase it. Um, Like, how it moves, how it acts, will be partly based off the animal. Yeah. Um, but that's why I've left a lot of details. Like, when I say hit, um, you can hit the manifest of beast with, feasts, with fists, feet, claws, other weapons. It's a physical attack. You can use an item, you can use your lycanthropic claws or teeth or whatever. You're just hitting it. I, I've basically made the action so generic. It's just... Um, with lycanthropic action, it'll be something enhanced. Effectively, it's you're going a bit beyond just using the generic weapon. Probably goring was not necessarily the best example, but... Like, these will generally come down to the character and the table work out based off how they describe it, what the effect is, rather than it being a prescribed... This is the mechanical effect. It's kind of like, these things are intended to be more nuanced and more up to the table or the uh, game master, depending on who's running the game. Um... You know, it's, it's, because to a degree, a special action is you using the bonds you formed and accepting yourself and your emotions to overcome this adversity in physical form. So... And then we need to work out uh, the decks. And I need to work out scenarios. Uh, basically, I have to come up with a bunch of activities, activity event decks, the result table for each activity, uh, the temperature and weather event decks, and then the scenarios, the scenario decks. I mean, I think... Once I've got this done, because it's just random, I think if at the very least I can get one scenario and the basic stuff done, I would be very happy with uh, this if we get that all done by the end of the month. Um, I mean, it's definitely something I could consider in the future is trying to add other monsters or other scenarios. I'm not really sure what other scenarios I would do really are, because I've got modern day city camping in the woods. And a cabin in the woods, which are all slightly different. Uh, the cabin and camping is slightly similar, but um, it's kind of like the amount of humans you would meet. So, yeah, it's a. Uh... Well, they have. Well, it depends what they're trying to do. If they're just going to whack it, it's fine. Um, they, by the nature of, because a lot of the rules I've had is if they share a trait with the beast, they'll get an advantage or a disadvantage. At the moment, it's mainly been disadvantages. It would probably be the same there. So if for them, it's they because they share a trait with the beast, it means they're at a disadvantage. 
you know, it's rather hard to calm your own inner beast. It's, um, there's a risk that they could empower their beast. Some of it's just if you share a trait, the beast has an easier time resisting your magic, which also kind of makes sense. Um, but again, if they channel the beast for their special positive attack, because they share a trait, the beast will take more damage. So, it's going to be interesting. It, it, So basically today what I'm going to try and do is get at least the gather skill done. Um, if I can make, if I can get all the player stuff done, which is gathering special actions, that'll be a bonus. Then next time we could do the beast. And then after that I can start working on some of these. Um... Basically, one of my big problems at the moment is uh, I've got studying I've been doing, and I've got a next piece of coursework due on the 11th, and I've got like eight questions still to answer. So, <laughs> uh, that should be fine, uh, because basically I've done some work today. If I can get a couple of those questions answered, maybe this evening after doing some streams, or I've got Monday, Tuesday. Um, preferably, I'd like to be able to get it done by Monday, because Tuesday FF14's new patch comes out. And I'd like to be able to play that on the day, but if I have to study, I will study. Um, so at least this week, uh, I'm going to be a bit stuck. Um, and then I've got my next bit of assessment will be due on the 30th. So then I've got another two and a half weeks. I'm currently studying cybersecurity. It's very basic stuff. It's like define this, explain this. Um, basically, the next like seven questions I've got to answer. They're all like they are not. When I say seven questions, they're not really seven questions. It's like twenty-one-ish questions because it's like part A, part B, part B two, B three, B four. Effectively, I've got to do a load of. Um, descriptions of social engineering and how are the accounts that my friends family and organizations i work for involve on uh, social networks and stuff where potentially is there weaknesses where information could be gleaned by someone trying to uh commit social engineering and trying to get stuff so it's like oh that's what you uh i can't actually remember what i don't actually know what the uh bit of the end of the month is hold on i can, I can answer that question i've got a lot of social engineering which is the descriptor for what i've got to do now uh the next will be legal and ethical aspects of cyber security will be the module i have to do for the end of the month um So, yeah, it's it's going to be a busy month. As I said, my mood for games design is going to be up and down based on how this wizard ODL shit goes about. So, I would I would like, I think at the very minimum, I'd like by the end of the month to have all of this done and then maybe have one scenario. Because I can then go to myself, okay, you're going to make two more scenarios. You're going to release two more scenarios once you release those two scenarios that's fine next thing you're going to do is potentially just um give this all a second look check the language i mean to be fair i should do that before is uh check the language check the formatting make sure it all works do some stuff on lines and veils um And yeah. It's it's getting there, it just oh god. <laughs> you know. And then what I want to do is I want to just get some player stuff done uh today and then 
what I will probably do is take like a half hour break. I might not take a half hour break. We'll see how I'm feeling or if I'm flagging. Um, basically, we'll take a break and then I'll come back and we'll just do some video games. Because I have been stressing and working all weekend so I could really just do with some video games. And like we'll do some Harvestella or Hades or, S or Mass Effect. We'll just see what I'm um, feeling up to. It'll probably be Hades, just because that's nice, easy. I can just start and finish whenever I feel comfortable. And that's going to be today. So yeah, let's get on with gathering. Um... Yeah, I think it didn't help the autistic brain with having a, a long holiday and then you had a bank holiday Monday because for Tuesday I was just going, oh, it's Monday and then I had to be kept getting told, no, it's it's Tuesday. And it's like Wednesday. And then, of course, um, I'm having to do some cover work at the moment, so I had to work Saturday morning, which was fine. But I would normally only work a Tuesday afternoon and a Saturday afternoon with the cover work. But I also had to do Thursday afternoon to cover for someone else who wasn't able to make the cover work because they were on leave. So my entire week's like schedule and flow was completely fucked. And then at the moment it's not fun working for local government. So, um... I'm going to make this simple. Yeah, and it was basically I'm at work. If I look away from work towards my social medias, all it's filled with was screaming about the OGL leaks, and it was like there is no escape from shit right now. It's like I can't look at the news, I can't look at social media, I can't look at work. Everything's on fire. The only positive was we got to play some D&D &D this week. That's the only positive that came out this entire bloody week. Ugh. The one thing um, I may do if I want to break from this at any point is I have agreed with a few friends. We are going to be taking part in the Dungeon 23. Now, how Dungeon 23 is meant to work is every day of the year for 2023, you are meant to... Each day you are meant to come up with a singular room, something in that room, and then at the end of every month, you move one floor down. How I am going to try and do it is... I will, instead of doing it every day, is, my aim is every month I will get the full month's worth of rooms done. What I will probably try to do is, I'll do it on a weekly or bi-weekly basis, basically going, right, I'm just going to get a load of rooms done to make up for what I owe, if that makes sense. Um, purely because between studying other games design streaming the time i'm not streaming when i'm resting and trying to you know recover uh... basically what i'm trying to do is not uh, burn myself out entirely so instead of doing daily because i take far because if i'm not in the right headspace i'm not going to get it done rather than stressing and adding more weight and burden what i'm gonna do is i'm just gonna go right 
if I have to. If we hit the 31st, because I've got two study things and I'm doing this game jam. If at the end of the 31st I just have to design all 31 rooms for January, I will do it that way. Um, we, we, we'll see how it goes, but basically that's my plan, is instead of... Uh, if I need a break or if I just have some free time is you might just see me doing a game design stream where I'm just coming up with random room ideas. Uh, I already know what dungeon I want to do. So the interesting thing will be coming up with stuff to do it. Because in reality there's going to be 12 floors. Which I'm not sure is quite deep enough for actually what I want to do. But... Here will give me a good starting point. Nine, ten, eleven, twelve. I could split it up further. Um I definitely could. Um, for context, there is an idea I love playing with, with anything I touch that's sci-fi, which is a ever-expanding, ever-changing Dyson Sphere, where every level of the Dyson Sphere you go down, it just gets weirder and weirder. And it's kind of used as a museum of curiosities. Um, And the deeper you go down, the less you're meant to access and the less you're meant to um, delve, if that makes sense. So yes, that is uh, something we'll do. Nothing so right. How do I want to do this? So I get a gathering trait test. That's a deed one too well, plus you'll gather skill. Um, right, so how do I want to do this? Generally, we would go and make a gathering test, but what if? No, no, that works. What if?
Uh, for this, it's combat. This is specifically in combat. So um, it's effectively, you can either cast a spell, hit someone, or gather. So effectively, gathering is something you can do to give uh, another member of the party a free buff. gathering rob can also change the environment but the key thing is there's no mechanical effect to that it's just this thing it um this thing will uh 
change the battlefield and then the players can all decide and the game master can decide how that works. What how effective it is at helping. Yeah, basically. They can describe it as they find it, or it's just effectively gathering now has an effect that can change the environment to just assist others. It's mainly just I wanted every trait to have something cool that it could do that wasn't just punch. So gather can actually change. Gather can basically make other people stronger or themselves stronger or they can modify the environment whereas someone with the three uh, mental stats can kind of cast spells to do something cool or if you're just like physique or endurance you're just you're just gonna punch a dude just gonna punch Then we get special actions. Okay, so...
prefer this phrase, uh, at least for this game, is game guide.
Do that. I'm just uh, trying to work out how to do this. Uh... Best beast. Special action to call upon the beast within.
Um. I think. What we could do is we are going to call it there for now doing this, because basically next session, or if I have the energy between now and next games design stream. I'll maybe look at doing the Beast Within rules, and then we can start looking at this stuff. But we've done special actions, we've done actions, we've done some stuff that hopefully cool and make, no matter your character build, you can do something cool and interesting. Um. Oh dear. So what we will do, yeah, what we'll do is we will uh, stop there for now. Said we've got beast within to do. What I think I'm going to do is briefly go to the break screen uh, just for a moment, just to allow me to change what we are. Um, Give me just a moment, everyone. 